Going live. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a few minutes for people to uh, wander on in. I'm trying to uh, figure out how to share this with one person in particular. Uh, my poor internet connection hates me. My cat loves me because I have sliced ham. Come here, kitty, kitty. Tora. Kitty cat. There she is. Here you go. Okay, Tora, you need to say hi to, to the people. Uh, okay, that ain't happening. Come here, sweetie pie. Did you, are you, you're still eating? Finish it then. All right. Come here, sweetie. Say hello. Say hello, Tora. I am not convinced that this cat is a domestic breed. If she didn't have a tail, I would say bobcat. But uh, she just acts more like a wild animal, except she likes me. Uh, not so much today because the uh, batteries in the laser pointer went dead from all her chasing of the elusive red dot okay let me get settled in oh of course the outside cat must have noticed that we had ham all right okay it, it's actually about the time that she usually demands some treats of one sort or another so i'll tear up some sliced ham for sweetie who lives outside and i'll be right back so don't go away move it Dora. Okay, sweetie used to be mommy, and but I changed her name because she never forgave me for selling her babies. Cats are funny that way. I see I didn't lose anybody, so I guess it's safe to begin. First, <coughs> remember to thank our veterans regardless of whether you were for any particular war they really didn't have a choice they either signed up or got drafted that's me uh camping the pack of cigarettes uh they either signed up or got drafted, and once they were in, they had no choice. They were told to go to war, and they did. And most served quite honorably. Wow. So let me see. I have five whole listeners, and I'm the only one chatting here. Hi, Oswald. Waltzy Matilda. Yeah, that's a, an Australian song I 
learned in the fifth grade, we had a music teacher come in once a week and he'd play a zither and have us sing. Once a jolly swag man camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolie bar tree. And he laughed and he sang as he waited while his billy boiled. You'll come a waltzy Matilda with me. I'm glad you like my voice. I can't stand to listen to my own voice, but I'm told that's common. Anyway, then he explained that waltzy Matilda meant you're going to jail. So eventually the, the law comes along because he's poached a, 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 probably a goat, maybe a sheep, and that's what he's boiling under the shade of the Kuliba tree. And, well, I love to sing. It's good to know someone wants to hear me sing. Um, hmm. Anyway, let's thank all veterans. They served most with great honor and courage. Courage isn't being unafraid. Courage is doing the right thing even though you're scared. Um, Poopless. I don't like to cuss, although when I'm alone and the computer won't do what I want, you should hear me cuss. No, you shouldn't. Anyway, it just happened to fall on Veterans Day primarily because I lost the connection yesterday. Yeah. And as we learned in the Vietnam era, the military was really the only choice for many young black and Hispanic men. If you think prejudice and discrimination and bigotry are bad now, you should have lived through the 60s. Our neighbor had a black maid who couldn't shop for groceries in Culver City unless she had a white person with her. They wouldn't sell to her at the grocery store. And half the neighbors uh, complained about Mary Rubin who had the black maid because Mary was a Jew and that if the prejudice was so widespread, you wouldn't believe it. I remember shortly after the civil rights bill passed, it was actually the second one. The first one was 1957 under President Eisenhower, LBJ, also known as Lyndon Baines Johnson, passed the, well, Congress passed, and he signed the second one in 1964. And I saw some black ladies shopping in Culver City, and I couldn't help staring, but not because they were black. It was because they were beautiful. They turned out to be students from UCLA. And there I was, nine or 10 years old, just open mouth staring. We just didn't see people of color, not even uh, what we called Mexicans. Yes, Oswald, don't blame troops for unjust wars. So anyway, in the 60s, quite often young black men who did not want to join gangs or just be bums would join the military because that was a job and they got paid and many of them were sacrificed in Vietnam. Don't blame them. Uh, 
let's see, Oswald's sister, there are so few blacks in Oregon, <laughs> you can't help glancing at them. Yeah, well, where I live now, it's a small, small town in the mountains of San Bernardino. We have all sorts of people. We even have Jesus freaks and uh, Rastafarians and Buddhists and New Agers and, you know, who cares what color their skin is? They're Jesus freaks. <laughs> uh, and born again. Well, I guess I'm born again, but I don't go around, you know, shouting it to the world. If someone wants to know about Jesus Christ, sure, I'll tell you. He saved me. He saved more than my skin. He saved my soul. But maybe that's too much information. Usually I do Ancient of Days on Sundays and read from the Bible and talk about it. Jesus lotion. Well, I'll tell you, one of the local shops has been offering vegan meals, but the chef is not a vegan, which seems strange, but he is um, some kind of Eastern mystic. I'm not sure that he's Buddhist. I think he's something else, but I don't know what to call it. Um, but, oh, I... <laughs> Last time I ate a vegan dinner there, I've done it twice. I um, I tried to be very gentle when I complained about the puff pastry that he made from scratch. But he really took it badly. I sent him a private message on Facebook explaining that I don't even try to make puff pastry because it's so difficult, but his was dry and overcooked. And I thought he should know. Everyone at my table thought the same thing, but they were afraid to tell him. It, it needed something. It really did like maybe a sauce um, or a maple syrup. It, it was vegan, so you couldn't add butter, but olive oil would be okay. I don't know. But he also cooked it too long. Anyway, so I'm persona non grata, and first chance he got, he slammed me on Facebook. Uh, in a private message, but then he blocked me so I couldn't respond, so I blocked him back. And he joined some other group who were just throwing trash around, trash and dirt on some of our local pages until they made the mistake of uh, uh, joining or drawing into the attack a couple other solid citizens who took offense and they also blocked them and kicked them off of the pages. But it wasn't this particular vegan chef's fault, really. Someone else started it. And I'm thinking, uh, no, I don't need this, so I just am not going to be friends with people who use such venom to call me a hater when they hate obviously hate me enough to actually do physical harm would phil be on social media oh he'd probably be composing new novels on twitter and instagram and facebook and any other place he'd have a blog and he'd tell you what he ate for breakfast and you'd all like it he'd have 10 million likes and people would be translating his blog into French and Italian and Russian and Polish and so forth. They might even translate it into British English, which, by the way, is 
really quite different from American English. Now, of course, uh, speaking of Britain, they really suffered in two great world wars. Yeah, we kind of got bombed. I mean, the Japanese U-boat shelled um, Santa Barbara, but it didn't do much damage because most of their missiles were duds. The Germans uh, tried to invade various harbors on the East Coast, but they weren't very successful. <laughs> but England? Oh, my. They lost a whole generation in World War I. We call that the lost generation. And yes, we lost many young American men, but there's no comparison to England where suddenly there was one man for every four women of marrying age. And in World War II, oh my, the Blitzkrieg, Germany bombing the well, bombing the streets of London to dust. And France got it pretty bad, too. A lot of the land wars took place in France. But what you need to realize that actually in both wars, just like the war against Napoleon centuries earlier, about 200 years earlier, The war was won, not by America, not by England. Yes, we won in the West, but that was, by that point, pretty much a mop-up operation. The war was really won by Russia in World War I, and Russia really, really lost a great deal. That's when a treaty just didn't do right by Russia. Russia had to pay reparations for World War I. And by 1940, while well, World War II was just beginning, Russia was forced into a treaty in which they gave up the Ukraine, including Crimea. Now, Russia had spilled a great deal of blood in this thing called the Crimean War when they kicked the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, out of the Ukraine. Otherwise, the Ukraine would still be a Turkish satrapy, S-A-T-R-A-P-Y. And here they're forced to give it up and... Sebastopol in the Crimea is their only, is Russia's only warm water port. And yeah, it was the Soviet Union from about 1918 to about 1991, but it was mainly Russia. And Hitler lost many, many troops at Stalingrad where the women were in the factory building tanks, which the men hopped into as soon as they came out the door. The Russians were so poorly equipped in both world wars that when the guy in front of you fell down, you picked up his gun because you didn't have a gun. Only the first row in many cases, had guns. And they're facing a well-armed, well-equipped German army that unfortunately did not have winter uniforms in the middle of the Russian winter. And Hitler would have conquered Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union, if he had not decided to send half his armies down to Kiev and Sebastopol down in the Ukraine. It was a strategic target, but it made it impossible to take Moscow. 
especially since the habit of the Russians, like when uh, Napoleon attacked Moscow, well, the people all left. They burned down all of Moscow and said, here you go. And, and Napoleon's troop marched into a burned out city. No people, no food, no nothing. And if Hitler had seemed to be about to take Moscow, it would have happened again. What are you doing, you rotten cat? The little pink light is dead. The batteries have died. You want to chase that? So anyway, we owe a great debt to Russia and the Soviet Union, whether we admit it or not. And yes, D-Day was a bloodbath. Many of our troops drowned without ever getting to shore because their boats uh, didn't make it to the shore. And still more were gunned down by German machine guns. Oh, hi, Kev T, T and hi, Red Pill. Good to see you here. So anyway, even though the Soviet Union was the big red scare and we had the Cold War and all, uh, we'd probably be a, a German colony if it hadn't been for them just digging in and, and not giving up when Hitler's armies attacked them. And in World War I, the uh, Kaiser's army. And as um, I'm learning from real scholars like Joseph P. Farrell and Walter Bosley and um, Scott D. Hart and what's his name? Can't remember the name. Uh, anyway, um, Germany's still trying to take over the world, but this time it's economic. It's called the European Union, and it's really a sort of pact between Germany and France to take over the world economically. Unle unleash. I wish you could spell unleash. Unless, oh, the man in the high castle, yes, um, Germany kind of won World War II. The not, well, Germany lost, but the Nazis won. They're all over South America, especially Argentina, but they're also here. And they aren't necessarily Germans. There's lots of um, Native-born Americans who are Nazis, they like the Nazi philosophy and politics and racism. I met a few when I was a child. Didn't like them then, don't like them now. And I had a little trouble back in 1988, I think it was. 88 or 9, I think 88, yeah, March of 88, down in the city of Orange, I had this nice little house in Old Town Orange, and uh, witnessed a crime at the neighbor's house, which had been perpetrated by a member of the Ku Klux Klan, had lightning bolt tattoos on his cheek and everything. And I was just a freaking witness, and they did their darndest to scare me. And when that didn't work, they tried to get me arrested so that my testimony would be worthless. And as it turned out, even though I went to court and got on the witness stand, the jury was not in the room. I answered a few questions, and the judge said, well, this isn't relevant. We don't need it. No one even asked me what I saw. And for that, I had to leave town and, and put my house up for sale on an emergency basis because I couldn't make the house payments and live in another county. 
I've had it with Orange County. I don't care what their politics is or how wealthy the town is or how great the schools are. I've had it with them. I'll just stay in San Bernardino because it's better the devil you know. And San Bernardino has a reputation as the most corrupt county in the United States, and I believe it. But I'm on a mountain in a small, unincorporated community where I like most of the people. Knee-ish? Yeah, I'm streaming. Not sure who Knee-ish is. I know Oswald and Tim, and I think I know Kev. Anyway, Knee-ish looks familiar. So anyway, as I was trying to do yesterday when I gave up after 10 minutes because I kept getting disconnected and finally I couldn't get reconnected. Ah, Nox Mente. Yes, I'm sure I've seen the, the one with Walter Bosley. Seen or heard, I mean. Heard. Even when it is a video, I usually lie down and just listen. Anyway, um, I was talking about information. Well, Nee-ish, send me a message on my channel here at YouTube or, or on Facebook where I, I'm actually there under my actual name. Cook County, Illinois. Yeah, that's where Phil was born. My late ex-husband was born in Chicago. That's in Cook County, Illinois. But believe me, San Bernardino down the hill is just as dangerous as Detroit or Chicago. Maybe more so. And it's filled with homeless people who keep not on purpose, but because they're stupid, they keep setting the brush on fire when they try to cook their meals or, or get warm. Anyway, let's see. I just gave you a bunch of information about Germany, Nazis, world wars, and so forth. And remember, even veterans who never left the states or just, you know, worked in the mess tent cooking slop. I forget who said it, but they also serve who only stand and wait. They were there and they were ready and willing. Ah, Jerry's your co-host. Well, Oswald says Jerry is lazy. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Okay. Well, I'm not going to give out my email address here. I've already had people spoofing my email. If you look at all the details, the reply to address is not mine. Well, you're not on Facebook. You're not on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Instagram or I might have signed up once, but I wouldn't know how to get on it now. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think I'm Tuffy777. Oh, come on, you evil thing. It popped the cursor out of the chat box. Now, if I'm not Tuffy777, I'm Busby777. Let me see. If the... Um, if the internet will manage, okay, home. How do I find my Twitter thingy profile, I guess? 
Yeah, I'm Tuffy777. Just keep in mind, I don't, I don't check it all that often. Okay. I spent my last 10 bucks on a pack of cigarettes. After this one, I, I'm just out. I do have an e-cig until the refill runs out, but I, I will be ranting and raving for sure once I can't smoke. Let's see, if I'm counting right, I've been smoking for 50, yeah, 50 years, almost exactly. I ain't quitting now. Oh, you found me. All right. Now, see, on a private message, I can give you my email. Oh, yeah, Oswald got to hear me sing because he, he named a song, and I knew it. I love um, karaoke. But it's funny because the people who, who do the karaoke machine are so young. I'll ask for a John Denver song and they never heard of it. My gosh. I don't ask for Barry Manilow, but I wonder if they've heard of him. Oh, no, I could never match Ella Fitzgerald. She's awesome. I have been known to try to do Janis Joplin, but I just can't do her voice. I can sing Bobby McGee, but I'm not JJ. Oh, well, no way to private. Oh, okay. I'll give Oswald my email on Facebook. I know his real Facebook name. I'll have to do that with my phone so I don't risk losing this. It looks pretty stable today, but I'm not getting a lot of bars on my little, um, <clears throat> what you call it. It's not a modem. It, it's this thingy that gives me wireless internet only. I've been forced to put a code to lock my phone. Oh, he says he might have a new listener. Yay. I can't always listen to friends' shows on whatever there, my email is sent to, to uh, Oswald on Facebook Messenger. Um, I just, I'm trying to write this here book, and it's all about information. It's called the X, like letter X in exegesis. And of course, it's about my late husband, late ex-husband, Philip K. Dick, author of Blade Runner and Minority Report and Total Recall and a lot more, who, of course, became rich and famous as soon as he was dead. That's how it seems to happen with authors, and I... I hope it happens with me because I would love to leave a fortune to my son. Right now, he helps me as much as he possibly can, but his father's estate is not making all that much money. He actually works for a living and has an expensive wife, a grown daughter who... Um, has become a bottomless pit. But maybe she'll straighten up. She's in her late 20s.
too late, Oswald. I sent you my email. Um, you know, so I'm, as they say, poor as a church mouse. But I'm getting by. Now, my Social Security would have been a lot of money in the 70s when I was working. It's nothing now. And because I was primarily self-employed, I paid twice as much as someone working for a company. I had to pay 100%, whereas... It, if you have a job job, you know, you pay half and the company pays half. Oh, Dave Cruz. That sounds familiar. Thanks for inviting him, Oswald. I'll be right back. My coffee's cold and half empty. Oh, now it's lukewarm, but almost full. Oh, we're Facebook friends. How come you aren't playing criminal case? I have to be careful about asking friends to play criminal case because it has some pretty gory, cartoonish scenes. You play a cop who solves murders. But uh, I tried to do Farmville too, but it doesn't load. I think you have to have really high speed internet to play that game. Or maybe a brand new computer. Or both. Oh. Well, Next time I'm on Criminal Case, I'll see if I can invite people. It isn't for the squeamish, even though they're cartoons, you know, they're pretty realistic. It's mostly uh, looking for the hidden objects. And they aren't always all that well hidden, but there's so many of them that you, you have to figure out which one you're looking for and click on it and half the time I click and I'm not quite on the object anyway and then you figure out who done it which is always fun so the X in exegesis I've been going through books including of course the exegesis of Philip K. Dick and the selected letters of Philip K. Dick. I have only the one uh, volume, 1980 to 1982. And uh, I really need to buy all of them, but I don't have a book budget at the moment. What I have is a, I need to, a plumber and I need to uh, get this cat spayed. I didn't want another cat, but her humans had an emergency. They were fleeing a domestic situation in the middle of the night and posted a desperate message on Facebook that they couldn't take the cat with them. And within half an hour, they had dropped the cat off at my house. She's a female who hasn't been spayed, and the vet says uh, she'll have to have her shots too. They don't um, deal with unvaccinated cats. And I've tried various clinics and so forth, and they all pretty much want the cat to have the shots and get spayed. And the only help I can find is uh, actors and others. And uh, they can't come up with more than 20 bucks. 
but a, a local friend donated another 20. So I'm getting close to where I can get her spade if I skip the plumber for a while. Apparently, well, it's called hammering, but it's only in the kitchen, not in the bathroom. So I can get by for a while. Oh, you think Hollywood will do a non-SF novel? I hope they do. The man whose teeth are all exactly alike. It deals with the problem of polluted drinking water in Marin County. It was a real problem when Phil lived there. It eventually became a scandal, so they had to fix it. <clears throat> well, if you guys want to hear me sing, you'll have to go to the replay, unless I get it inspired. TV series on Cimmerillions. <laughs> Cimmerillions. I'm not sure which one that is. I started to watch the crystal, the dark crystal, but I've forgotten to watch it again. I've been going through some of these letters and I think I found the real plot for the owl in daylight. No one noticed. But I'm not telling. It, um, it deals with <clears throat> your mind's ability or rather inability to see reality as it really is. Oh, J.R. Tolkien. Oh, Cimmerillion. I'll have to see if I can find that to watch somewhere. My sister put me on her Netflix family plan, and Amazon let me have Prime at half price. So it's $7 a month instead of 14 or 15 The show isn't made yet. Is it um, Netflix or Amazon Prime, I hope? In Milton Lumkey territory. I think that's the one where he has an affair with the woman who turns out to be his former school teacher when he was a kid. <laughs> well, anyway, the exegesis is an exploration of religion and philosophy. Oh, I hope it's Amazon. Their signal is more stable than uh, Netflix. Sorry. <laughs> Selling typewriters. Hi, Tim Greenglass. Yeah, Phil often wrote about unsuccessful salesman because he was one in a record store. He didn't do too badly until he, his uh, phobias got to him and he, he, he found himself unable to talk to people because he was scared. So he figured he'd better make a living by writing full time because he was scared to leave the house. And that was long before I met him. It was before he met Anne. He was married to Cleo. And he probably should have stayed with her. But this young Youngish blonde widow showed up at their door one day wanting to meet the new writer.
the new author who had moved into San Rafael. That was Anne Rubenstein, who became Anne R. Dick for a few years. I started looking at her biography of Phil, and there are so many errors. I, I just, I keep having to put it down. She has me, for example, marrying Phil in 1975 or six. Uh, he left me in 76. I married him in 73. Oh, and yeah, they all say that I left him because that's what he said. Never mind that Phil had a new girlfriend and a new apartment and new furniture. And I had to go live with my mother, the devil's sister. Because I couldn't pay the rent. What an idiot. Anyway, let's, let's get back to the exegesis. He was fascinated by Plato's idea of forms, of ideals, that, for example, there's only one cat, and it's like out in the ether somewhere, and all the cats that we see are just copies of the ideal cat. And, of course, Plato's cave. But he eventually concluded that Plato had it wrong, that this world is real, but we are not able to perceive it accurately. And that's really at the heart of his idea for the Owl in Daylight, in which people perceive the world wrong. And of course, uh, there's reasons for it, like um, implants in their brains, or, okay, I get to, <sighs> stupid, stupid YouTube thinks my name is a cuss word, so I have to allow these posts that have dick in them. Yeah, well, Anne was arrested for beating up Phil and striking the sheriff, but the judge threw it out. He just didn't believe that little blonde committed such violent acts, and even if she did, they weren't hurt, were they? Yeah. I was shocked at the way Anne talked about Nancy. She'd laugh hysterically as if Nancy were, were some kind of joke. Nancy is the most wonderful lady. She suffers with mental illness, but that's no reason to dismiss her like that. She's just wonderful. And she raised a wonderful daughter named Issa. I guess I shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but I just have no use for Anne. I have never met Cleo, but Phil never had anything bad to say about Cleo, ever. He said bad things about me. He was angry, but I'm sorry he left me. I, it took me forever to figure it out. He kicked me out of the house and then killed him, tried to kill himself because I left. Um, excuse me. Well, it turned out he then called his girlfriend who refused to move in with him. And then he called Doris Sauter and she refused. And then he tried to kill himself.
So I came back and tried to stick it out, and he eventually left anyway. And in one of his last letters ever written, he asks, do, do I, am I in love with Tessa? Perhaps. I could smack him upside the head about the millionth time that he asked me to take him back and get married again, I finally said yes, and then he went and died on me. And frankly, I divorced him because of his actions. I could not allow him to teach our son to treat women the way he treated me, plain and simple. And my son has grown up to be a good man who loves and adores his father and misses him terribly. I allowed Christopher to learn the good side of his father, and he was a great father. And I would have taken him back, and it probably would not have turned out well, but I was ready to take him back. I think he'd finally learned that it wasn't going to work with anyone else. I miss him. Of course I do. But um, I knew he'd die before I did, most likely. He was so much older, but he was only 53. And now I'm 65 and got a long ways to go. Well, for years and for decades, really, I refused to talk about the negative side of Phil. I considered myself his stand-in, his diplomat, his representative, because he isn't here to stand up for himself and so many biographers and reviewers and bloggers and just trashed his reputation. He was not a bad man. He was a tortured soul. And, and there was so much more good than bad, but he was not capable of being faithful. He just wasn't. And he, he loved cats, he loved his children, and sadly, both Anne and Nancy, especially Anne, refused to let him have a relationship with his daughters. There were, he was accused of being abusive toward children, and uh, that never was the case. Never. He didn't go out of his way to hang out with children, but when it came to his own children, he was very attentive and caring, and they didn't understand that he couldn't take them to Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm. He had physical illnesses that really, really made things difficult for him. In, on one occasion, early in our relationship, we went to Disneyland with friends. I think we went on one or two rides. I think we went on the uh, Matterhorn and, and the teacups something like that. That was back when you just paid admission and you bought tickets for the rides. Well, anyway, we were having uh, some coffee and it was getting dark and Phil just panicked and ran out to the parking lot and sat on the hood of Tim Powers' car. He couldn't take it. His phobias were taking over. Now, can you imagine if he took his 
daughter to Disneyland and that happened. He also had physical illnesses that we didn't appreciate until his children started coming down with the same symptoms. It's basically a chronic pancreatitis. It's genetic. It isn't from drinking or doing drugs. It's something he was born with. And having been born prematurely, he was especially vulnerable. It isn't quite so bad now for preemies. But he was born at home in Chicago in the winter and nearly died before his mother finally got the two twins to a hospital. She had a public health nurse come out and, and they were rushed to the hospital, but his sister was just too tiny to make it. Her lungs were not developed enough. She couldn't breathe. And frankly, if they had been born in the hospital, Phil would have been blind because this was before they understood that filling the incubator with oxygen was causing babies to go blind. But they were about three weeks old when they got to the hospital. So Phil was not blind. But I can tell you that his eyesight wasn't that good. <coughs> anyway, yes, some people use their children as weapons against their exes. I wanted my son to get to know his father, and he did. And when my babysitter flaked out on me and I had night school, I'd go to college after work, Phil was my babysitter. I dropped our son off for a couple hours once or twice a week. It was a good thing, too because our son grew up to be a good man. Well, anyway, exegesis. He had all kinds of strange experiences throughout his life. But in 1974, <coughs> what really happened, well, let's see, Phil exaggerated, embellished, and made stuff up. But what really happened was when he was um, put under a general anesthesia for an oral surgery and then took powerful pain medication when he got home, he began to remember a repressed memory. He had been up in Vancouver, Canada. I have to say that because there's a Vancouver, Washington in British Columbia. After he'd been um, guest of honor at a science fiction convention, he decided to stay on and rented an apartment. And one night, two men in black suits dragged him off the street and stuck him in the back of a black limousine. Oh, that's interesting. Oswald checked the calendar, Veterans Day. 1974 also fell on a Monday. Well, let's see. So it, this would have been February or March of 1972 that Phil was dragged off the street. He remembered sitting in the back of a black limousine with a man on each side of him. And I don't know whether they were our men in black, but they were men in black suits, and he said they looked like FBI. 
Well, anyway, they were talking to him and questioning him. And apparently they drugged him, hypnotized him, told him to kill himself and stuck him back in his apartment with a bottle of sleeping pills, which he proceeded to swallow. And he, he woke up seeing that he had swallowed all these sleeping pills, but not remembering that he had done it until years later in 74, then he remembered. But at the time, all he knew was he woke up sitting on the floor with a glass of water and, and well, an almost empty glass of water and an empty bottle of sleeping pills. And that's how he ended up in ex Calais, a drug rehab center, because he was an American, not a Canadian, so their health care system wouldn't cover him. And he had no money, so no one else could take him. And at first, um, they had him doing physical labor, but then they found out he was a writer. So they had him start working in their public relations office. But as soon as he got some money, he escaped and came down to Fullerton because Dr. McNally, a professor at Cal State Fullerton, had invited him to come down, said he would find him a place to live and give him work lecturing to his classes, and so he did. I think Phil was targeted because he had this phone call from Dr. Timothy Leary not too long before Leary was sent to prison. And then, of course, Timothy Leary escaped from prison. Now, nobody would have been tapping Phil's phone, but they would have been, uh, it was actually John Lennon's phone that Leary was using. And uh, I'm sure they had a tap on John Lennon's phone because of his tangles with the law over drug abuse. So when Leary escaped, they wanted to know uh, who he'd been in contact with before he went to prison and up popped Philip K. Dick. So they started investigating. And they found that Philip K. Dick had signed a petition in Ramparts magazine pledging not to pay his income taxes till we ended the war in Vietnam. Well, that figures. Lenin became an agent himself. Yeah, well, he couldn't go back to England that he was wanted. He skipped town. Skipped bail, I guess. <clears throat> anyway, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were having this their second bed in for peace in um, Montreal. And they were recording Give Peace a Chance. And Dr. Timothy Leary was one of the people present. And also present was the journalist, Paul Williams, who was a friend of Phil's and had his phone number. And he said, oh, let's call Phil. And he called him up and put Leary on the phone, and Phil claimed that John Lennon told him that the Beatles song Paperback Writer was about him, about Philip K. Dick, and that they were all big fans of his work. And I'll bet you that phone call got Phil under suspicion. That combined with Ramparts Magazine and the fact that a lot of young people were hanging around at Phil's house they weren't really Phil's friends. His wife, Nancy, had left him in the fall of 69. And, but her brother, Michael, had stayed behind. And he was much younger than Nancy. 
and Nancy was a bit younger than Phil, so they were Michael's friends, and some of them were using drugs. And uh, some of them were dealing drugs, and some of them were even uh, informants for the local sheriffs. So Phil had a tangled mess there. And he didn't know it. He didn't understand. He thought, yeah, the sheriffs might think I'm dealing drugs, but I'm not, so it's cool. And if they wanted to search the house, he'd let them right in. Go ahead. Search away. Oh, John Lennon was keen on Ubik, huh? Interesting. Ubik should be a movie. It would make a great movie. And I know the perfect ending for it. Quite different from Phil's ending. But I'm not going to give it away. Because it might become a movie. And not with my script. But there's always the chance of a remake. Later on down the line. Anyway, Phil just never understood. He never put it all together. I've only recently realized, oh, Leary escaped from prison in October of 1970, and Phil began to notice a lot of police activity surrounding his house in early 71, which culminated in an invasion of his home on November 17th, 1971. Now, he, he has claimed that everything was of value was taken, even my stereo. But in other sources, including conversations with me, he claimed that they left the valuables and just took his financial records and the manuscripts of the books he was writing or had written. But uh, when his personal property was shipped to him from by a friend up north, long after the house was sold, there was stereo equipment, and I don't think he had bought a replacement between November of 71 and February of 72 when he went up to Canada. It just isn't likely, but maybe. But he insisted that he had an expensive wristwatch, some cash, and even collectible coins sitting out in plain sight, and they didn't take those. Weird. Oh, now to the X. Phil thought that the, Christ, the cross that Christ was crucified on must have been shaped like an X. He was almost certainly wrong. It's really most likely that it was shaped like the letter T. But he was correct that the cross was not a symbol of the early Christians. And that it was not the symbol that Constantine had his troops use to, uh, to paint on their shields at a crucial battle for control of the Roman Empire. Actually, it was an X, but not just an X. It was Cairo. Um, I hate how it bounces the cursor out of the chat box. Chi, which is X, and Rho, which looks like a P. It's the letter X with the P coming down through the center of the X. Some idiot's phoning me. Telemarketer. If it's important, they'll talk to the, uh, oh, I have to look up the hooked X. Hooked 
X is also important, but I need to do more research. O R O R T A N T. Important. But I, I have to do more research on the hooked X. But the symbol that Constantine saw in the sky had his troops paint on their shields and later had stamped on coins with Constantine's name was the Chi Rho. An X with the P coming down through the center of the cross. It's the first two letters of Christ, which is the Greek for Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew. Um, it basically means the anointed one. Each king of Israel was a Messiah, an anointed one, and they would be anointed by the leading prophet. Samuel, for example, anointed David, and that made him a Messiah, an anointed one. But Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one, King of Kings. Oswald, yeah, it could be CIA, but my best guess is the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, since it all centered around drugs. Uh, Meshugana, you spelled it wrong. I think it's like that. Let's see. Not just Meshuga, Meshugana. Yiddish for crazy. It is close to Mashiach. What I really wonder about, speaking of things sounding the same, we have uh, the Shema, God is one, and Hashem, the name. They sound almost like re mirror images. Hashem, Shema. So let's see. Shema, God is one, and Hashem, the name. A, a, uh, an Orthodox believing Jew will not say Yahweh. They'll say the Lord, Adonai, or they'll say Hashem, the name. I don't think God's name is Jehovah or Yahweh anyway. We aren't supposed to know God's name in ancient times, at least. Knowing a person's real name gave you power over that person. And that is why, by the way, most Christians had a secret Christian name. So like the Romans or, or the Greeks or whoever could call them Joe, but that wasn't their real Christian name. I know a little Yiddish, not a whole lot, and some of it's cuss words. Yeah. Well, let's see. Phil fought the cross on which Jesus was hanged would have been shaped like an X, but it's just not likely because they placed a sign above his head. Now, the uh, experts say it must have been like a capital letter T, but how could the sign be above his head? Well, I guess it could be, but it would be between his hands. I'm going with the lowercase t, which would allow the sign to be placed on the post above the cross piece. And the sign, by the way, had his name in three languages. Um, I think it was Latin, Greek, and Aramaic 
in any case, when the different gospels have different specific wording of the message, here's the king of the Jews, maybe it's because it was in three different languages and they were all slightly different. Aramaic, by the way, is what Jesus spoke. And it was actually the language that the Jews picked up in Babylon around 600 AD. I'm sorry, BC, 600 BC, approximately, the Jews were taken to Babylon. And since they were the people of Judea, they, I don't call them Israelites, I call them Jews. But there were probably people from all 12 tribes. And they learned Aramaic in Babylon, where they stayed for 70 years until the king of Persia came along, conquered Babylon, and allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Hmm. Oswald says Aramaic is related to Ahriman, the bad, the bad god, the darkness, the dark lord. Well, okay, I don't know. I haven't researched that. Anyway, um, most of the people did not return to Jerusalem. They liked the luxurious lifestyle of Persia. And for centuries, Persia was a Jewish country. Oh, you have a video about Melchizedek. Nice. Well, anyway, uh, when the uh, Mongol hordes were threatening Persia, a Jewish country, the uh, Muslim Arabs said, hey, just allow us safe passage. We'll take care of the Mongol hordes. So the Jews said, sure. And the Muslim Arabs did. And once they uh, fought off the Mongol hordes, they said, gee, we like this land. We're going to settle down and live here. What are you going to do about it? And so Persia became a Muslim country. But they lived at peace with the Jews for the most part for centuries. It's only in recent times that it's become a problem. And it was actually during Nixon's presidency that Persian Jews began fleeing Iran, which is what they now call Persia. Because their lives were truly in danger. Melchizedek. Uh, there's very little information about Mil Melchizedek. We know that Abraham uh, gave him a tenth of all the spoils of war. And he blessed Abraham. Now the one giving the blessing is of higher status than the one receiving the blessing. And Jesus is said to be a priest forever after Melchizedek, after the... I had a word. Well, like Melchizedek. But we don't really know who he was, and looking at the meaning of the name just gets awfully confusing. It could mean king of kings, or it could mean that he's a pagan king, or a pagan god, a priest of a pagan god. But Melchizedek was both priest and king in Solomon, which we think was probably Jerusalem before it became known as Jerusalem, Salem, or Salem. Being both priest and king, 
that's what Jesus is also, priest and king. But not a Levite. The priests were supposed to be Levites. Moses was a Levite and his brother Aaron was a Levite. Oh, the relationship to Lot. Yeah, well, Lot was an idiot. He loved the luxury of the city. And he put up with all the sin and corruption of Sodom. Because it was a great place to live, except for the orgies and uh, child sacrifice and bestiality and never mind Lot was an idiot a fool you know why they call Las Vegas Sin City oh here we go again uh, YouTube thinks that Oswald is cussing uh, he probably is, but I'm letting it go. So the X is also in the fish sign that Phil made a big deal of. I can't make the Greek TH, so I'll just do an English TH. The Greek TH is like an O with a horizontal line through it. Kind of like a zero with a line sideways across the middle. Ichthus is fish. Now, it's supposed to stand for Jesus Christ, King of, or, I'm sorry, Son of God. The I is for Yesu, Jesus. The X, the Chi, is for Christ, Christos. The TH which is one letter in Greek, is for Theos, or God. And Y is Yudi. I don't think they put an S on the end for, for a plural, but anyway, the X is the second letter, but it stands for Christ. That's another X in exegesis. And by the way, Phil was not struck by a pink beam emanating from the golden fish sign that the lady from the pharmacy was wearing on a pendant around her neck. Horse pucky. He did ask her about her necklace, and she did tell him about the fish sign, but he already knew all that. We had a fish sign sticker. It was a bumper sticker, but it, Phil taped it up on our living room window. And the setting sun caught, caught that sticker just right, so when Phil turned away, from the door to go take his pain pills. The reflected sunlight hit him in the face and temporarily blinded him. So once he went into the dark hallway and the dark bathroom where he got some water to take his pain pills, he kept seeing this pink fish sign from the phosphine activities in his eyes after he'd been blinded by the reflected light from the sticker which was in silver letters on a black background Phil knew all about the fish sign and he wasn't hit by a pink beam he was blinded by a bright light and then kept seeing these pink letters ichthys fish it probably was an early symbol for early Christians. They didn't use the cross until the 
time of Constantine. Who, by the way, made Christianity legal. Not really the state religion, but legal and eventually got baptized before he died. There were political reasons why he could not get baptized until he was nearly dead. It doesn't mean he didn't believe. And Constantine didn't take any books out of the Bible. He told the, the bishops to put together all the books that belong in the Bible and make one book for each of the churches. Make a copy for each of the churches. And he left. He didn't tell them what to do. And um, what they did was to go, okay, people have been accepting this book for centuries. We'll keep it. They kept the four gospels that everyone had been using. And that's all they had. There were a few Coptic Christians in Egypt who had some other books that we call gospels. But that doesn't mean that the um, bishops in, I'm blanking on where they were. They were within the Eastern Empire. They weren't in Egypt. They didn't read Coptic. They didn't have these Egyptian texts. Coptic was the Egyptian language in a sort of a Greek alphabet. They had manuscripts in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew. They didn't even have any in Latin. The Vulgate was translated from these Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew much later. Uh, anyway, um, the one, only one controversy of any note was over the Book of Enoch. Now, um, the scholars call it First Enoch because there are three books of Enoch, but the other two are much later. First Enoch can reliably be dated to between 200 B.C. and 100 B.C. And that's the manuscripts we have. There might have been earlier manuscripts, but we don't have them. Now, Give me a second to get some water. Now, Enoch, or first Enoch, tells us about those naughty angels who came down and took human women for their wives and taught the men to make better weapons of war and taught the women to make poisons and makeup and, and all kinds of potions. Basically, yeah, people already engaged in war and sexual seduction, but these naughty angels just taught them how to do it better. Yeah, we know you're sinners. Let's help you sin better. Well, so it wasn't just that they had children who were giants. It was also that they brought forbidden knowledge. Sound like anyone we know? Uh, maybe the uh, serpent and the uh, um, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, the serpent is called Nakash. And yes, it does mean serpent or snake, 
but it also means shining one and it also means deceiver the shining serpent who deceives kind of sounds like lucifer and lucifer is not necessarily the devil or satan uh now nah, gosh well i can't write in hebrew but here you go. That's my best rendition of Nakash. I got that info from Dr. Michael Heiser, a scholar of Semitic languages, ancient languages like um, Sanskrit, Aramaic, Hebrew, even knows some Greek. He knows quite a bit of Greek. And my knowledge in that area is like a tiny, teeny teaspoonful, but it's enough that I can usually tell when someone's putting me on. People with lisps? Well, I'm only lisping because I'm not wearing my dentures. I haven't... I haven't cleaned them. It, wearing dentures doesn't mean you have to don't have to brush your teeth. It's just that you hold them in your hand while you're brushing them. And I've been lazy. Besides, as long as I'm eating soft food, I get more of the flavor when I don't have a big hunk of plastic in my mouth. Yeah, well... A friend of mine had just gotten dentures. She went straight from the dentist back to the office with her brand new dentures. And her job included answering the phone. And everybody waited intently for that phone to ring. And they were all watching and listening. And she picked up the phone and said, Sealy Mattress. And they all went and sat down because she got it right with brand new dentures. <laughs> she loved to tell that story and now I love to tell it. Well, anyway, apparently these um, 70, they say, 70 bad angels. There's different numbers in different places, but I like the number 70 for several reasons. They came down on Mount Hermon, which, by the way, is the same mountain where Jesus delivered the... I think... Ah, it's where he, he told Peter... On this rock, I will build my church. Yeah, it could be 72. Uh, it has to do with how many Israelites went down to Egypt. And how many fallen angels came down. And, there, and how many um, apostles Jesus sent out after the resurrection. It's either 70 or 72. Uh, the number means something. And I, I'm, I haven't completed either researching or thinking about it. But it, it means something. So read Deuteronomy 32, where... After the Tower of Babel, God divided the nations according to the number of, and many translations say the sons of Israel. But the Septuagint, the Greek translation, made by Jews in Alexandria, I think around 300 AD, uh, BC, bad. Bad brain, 300 BC or thereabouts. It says sons of God. That's the fallen angels. 
or no, it's not the fallen angels. Hey, it's a bunch of angels. Anyway, they're supposed to be, if you go back to Genesis 11, you'll find the god-awful listing of the number of nations, and it's either 70 or 72. Now, these are not the guys who came down on Mount Hermon, but these are angels who were told to uh, you you just kind of be a caretaker. You you be stewards over these people because I've had it with them. I'm God and they refuse to worship me. They keep making idols and sacrificing to these false gods. You you deal with them. The Tower of Babel was in. Babylon. They wanted to make a name for themselves by reaching up into heaven. Bad people. So anyway, this was long before Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, was ever born. Abraham might have been alive then. But if he was, he was still a child. So God divided the nations and put these little stewards over them, which reminds me, of course, of Lord of the Rings, in which the steward is told, it is not for you to resist the return of the king, steward, or to oppose, something like that. I forget the exact wording. Well, anyway... And then God, after dividing the nations, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Long, long story, but by the New Testament, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have decided that they own God. When in fact, God owns them, which is a problem. They don't want the Gentiles to get saved. And here's this Jesus guy hanging out with sinners, which is bad enough. He even heals Gentiles. He's, you know, well, what's he doing? And then, of course, after the death, resurrection, and ascension, here's Paul, formerly Saul, going around saving the Greeks, the Goyim, the Gentiles, they aren't God's people. Well, excuse me, but God was reclaiming the 70 or 72 nations whom he had disowned in Deuteronomy 32 because they were not worshiping him. They were filled with hubris, sinful pride. They wanted to be gods. Isn't that what the Nakash, the serpent, told Eve? Your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know, time after time, the, the scriptures don't blame Eve because she was deceived. It's, oh, Adam, what have you done? because Adam sinned knowingly. And the way John Milton put it in Paradise Lost, Adam ate the fruit because he would rather be kicked out and be with Eve than stay in Eden without her. That's a great and powerful love. But we don't, you know, that's John Milton. We don't find it in scriptures. Oh, wow. How long have we been talking? An hour and 40. Wow. And I still have seven listeners. Yes, I love Milton too. But I get irritated when radical atheists attack what they think is the Bible. And it's really John Milton or William Blake or, or um, Dante Alighieri. You know, the um, 
Divine Comedy with the <laughs> I'm blanking on the word for hell. We've got the Paradiso, Paradise. We've got the Purgatorio, Purgatory, and the Inferno, Hell. Do I know Sam Harris? And is he relevant? Oh, oh, I think I've seen him debating someone on uh, either Socrates in the City or the Veritas Forum. I, I haunt YouTube, waking up with Sam Harris. Well, you know, if you want to be an atheist, that's fine. But why do you have this great need to convert me? I'm a Baptist by accident. Phil was really concerned that I had never been baptized. And he was a faithful Episcopalian, even if he was a bit of a heretic. So we went to the Episcopal Church and talked to the priest, Father Rash. I better type that in chat, Father Rash, R-A-S-H-E, Holy Sacrament in Placentia on uh, Kramer. K-R-A-M-E-R. -E By the time you get down to Orange, it's Glacelle. Anyway, I think that's the street it was on. <clears throat> so anyway, right next to the post office, Blessed Sacrament. That's it. Blessed Sacrament, not holy. Anyway, Episcopal Church. And when the priest got to the part where I had to take six weeks of lessons before I could get baptized, I said, forget that. I went home and got out the yellow pages and called a Baptist church. And they baptized me the next Sunday. Full immersion, Southern Baptist in a backyard swimming pool. The kind where if you struggle, they hold you down longer to get all that sin out of you. It was awesome. So I'm a Baptist because that's how I was baptized. And I have visited other churches, even a Catholic church, although I can't stand the incense. And the Episcopal Paleans use the incense too. I think they ought to... Uh, pay for a little better brand of incense. Anyway, so I'm a Baptist, and once in a while I managed to attend the local Baptist church. But um, I'm not out to convert anyone. If you ask me about Jesus, I'll tell you. But uh, it's up to you. It, forced conversions never turn out well. You end up with people like the Rothschilds. They aren't Jewish ethnically. They are ethnic uh, descendants of Esau. In modern times, you would say they're Jordanian. Though was very religious, but not a churchgoer. He had a dispute with the church because they wanted to confess that his marriage to Nancy was sinful because they didn't grant him a divorce from Anne. Never mind Cleo and Jeanette who came before Anne. And he said, I'm not insulting my wife. So he was barred from the rail. He could attend services, but he could not take communion. So he did that at home became his own priest. 
even baptized our son by sprinkling and gave him his first communion. And as young as Christopher was, he remembers. So anyway, I really always knew there was a God. I don't know how or why I knew. I just always knew. I had trouble with Jesus being God and man at the same time. I still don't understand it, but I've come to accept it for a variety of reasons. And no atheist is going to shake my faith because God is not accessible through science, especially modern science, which is little more than bean counting. I can't prove that Jesus loves me. I can't prove that my son loves me or that Phil loved me. But I believe it because I have evidence. Yes, faith actually means trust. And you don't just trust, for example, that you're not going to fall off the earth and fly out into space because you trust, you believe, you have faith in gravity because you have evidence that gravity keeps you down on the earth unless you get in a jet, which takes an awful lot of faith. Jets can crash, but we do it. Cars can crash, but we drive them. Cats can grab your cell phone charger and hide it under the bed. But you kind of love your cat. You don't trust her. <laughs> you trust that she will grab your cell phone charger and hide it under the bed. But... Really, religion is not in the realm of science, but it does have evidence. We know that the tomb was empty. Carol Quigley. Now that was an interesting figure, and I don't know a whole lot about Carol Quigley, except that he was a spy. I'm sure Phil read about him. Anyway, um, we do have evidence that the tomb was empty. That doesn't prove that he rose from the dead, but it is evidence the tomb was empty. I think cats are magical creatures. You know, I had no intention of getting another cat. And it didn't occur to me at first when I rescued this one. But a couple weeks before I got her, I had dreamed of cuddling with a young cat, a, a kitten, which she is that I was sleeping and this cat was sitting on my chest and purring. And a few days after I got her, she did just that. And I realized, my God, she even looks just like the cat in my dream. I think she knew I was going to get her. Or my unconscious knew that I was going to get a little gray striped fiend. And when, when she starts running around the house, and now that she has cat toys, she really runs around the house. I, I got a little bag of cat toys, and I was 
pulling them out one at a time, and she grabbed the one with feathers and ran off into the bedroom and killed it thoroughly three times and then brought it back to me. And when I, I made it move, uh, she killed it again. <laughs> I saved the cat from catastrophe. Yeah. I suppose she saved me from something, but I'm not sure what. Well, anyway, it's getting on close to two hours here. I'm almost ready to wrap things up and have something to eat. I haven't eaten much today. Just an occasional nibble of cheese while I'm talking to you. Hmm. Mm. Real cheese, not that plastic crap. Cheddar cheese and jack cheese. No American cheese. Yuck. American cheese isn't cheese. It's cheese food. Made out of plastic. Phil wrote a story about a cat on a spaceship. You sure that was Phil? Oh, goody, I'm getting an invite for the show in my email. I will check it as soon as I have a chance. Information. I totally lost the trail of what I was going to talk about yesterday when the Internet wouldn't work for me, but that's okay. I think we've had a pretty good chat. All right, let me scroll up a bit. Carol Quigley, oh, the Prof Tragedy and Hope, Georgetown professor. Yeah, but there was something about Carol Quigley that was rather strange. I'm just... I'm going to have to do more research on Carol Quigley. I know that there was something odd about what he wrote, Tragedy and Hope, and basically that something about a deep state or elites that you... you oh, yeah, very critical of the Anglo-American establishment. Well, that's normal for an Irishman. Look at how... The English treated the Irish. <laughs> Tim, that does sound like Phil. Someone kills the cat, so they have to eat cat food for years. Yeah. That's punishment. All right. Well, anyway, I think I've heard... An, a radio interview with someone who either knew or, or researched Carol Quigley. It's just kind of vague in my mind. You know, anyway, that the English still consider us one of their colonies. And maybe we are. But keep in mind that the British monarchs are German. Yeah, Joseph P. Farrell and maybe Walter Bosley. I know Joseph talks about Carol Quigley now and then, but I haven't heard him talk about him in depth. I can't get past the paywall for any of the shows that I love. I, I just can't spare, even if it's just a couple bucks, it, it could break my poor budget. I'm barely getting by.
and there's so many I'd like to subscribe to, but um, just can't do it. And I refuse to pay for Coast to Coast. Only 15 cents a day, and you get to listen to reruns from 20 years ago. So, I'm sure they'll end up on YouTube eventually. I'm sure Quigley had some kind of inside knowledge. Something esoteric, perhaps. I'm just not clear on it right now but I can find out anyway um, you know the city of London which is part of what we call London is not ruled by the Queen once a year they have this parade where they make it clear that uh, they're actually, the banking district is actually a separate political entity. Most people are totally unaware of that. And the Rothschilds are not Jewish. They're descended from people who were forced to convert by the Jews uh, I think perhaps around 300 BC, somewhere between 600 BC and zero. Or maybe it was AD. I, I'm really n not clear on it, but the Rothschilds are only Jewish when they benefit from calling themselves Jewish. And a good sign of that is that, as Joseph Farrell has pointed out, only one Rothschild was actually arrested by the Nazis. He was this distant cousin down in Austria, who was hiding Jews from the Nazis, resisting the roundup of the Jews. The Rothschilds were not persecuted by the Nazis who hated Jews. That ought to tell you something. And by the way, in many major wars, including uh, the Napoleonic Wars, the wars against Napoleon, the Rothschilds funded both sides. And then um, the one Rothschild, forget which one, the one in London anyway, made a killing because he got the news early of who won at Waterloo and he bet on it. He placed a bet, a huge bet. And everyone thought that Napoleon had won and he bet against Napoleon because he knew before anyone else that Napoleon had lost. Talk about bankers, dishonest bankers. Oh, thank you, Oswald. I guess I would like to have more attention. I was going to be at the Philip K. Dick Film Festival in Los Angeles two days ago. They canceled the whole event because they didn't have enough ticket sales to pay for the use of the convention center. Oh, yeah, people forget that Hitler was Austrian. Well, you know, ever since the Kaiser in the 1800s, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, the primarily the Prussians have had wanted to unify Germany and they considered Austria a natural part of Germany and before World War II even more so before World War I a great deal of what is now Poland was actually Prussia 
a German, um, I guess a duchy, a, 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 an independent German state. They had Prussia and Bavaria and Schleswig-Holstein, which the Germans stole from Denmark and still have today. And uh, uh, Germany was not united, in other words. And the Kaiser tried to unite Germany, ended up with World War I, which Germany lost. So when Hitler annexed Austria and the people cheered the Nazis entering, he was annexing his home country for Germany. Amazing. Anyway, Berlin was in Prussia, not to be confused with Russia. Oh, they were all at the Greta Thunberg climate rally. Well, you know, Greta Thunberg is only here because she refuses to fly. She refuses to go on an airplane. She crossed the Atlantic in a propane-powered fiberglass boat made from uh, petroleum products with, of course, other boats following her to make sure she made it safely, and they burned diesel fuel. Oh, but she's all for the environment and won't get on an airplane. Oh, yeah, her parents are wealthy. I feel sorry for her. She's been brainwashed. Even if the earth is warming up and we're all going to end up with islands sinking and coastlines going under the waves, we can't stop it by giving up our SUVs. And I'm certainly not for electric cars that use batteries made from lithium that is mined by child labor in filthy conditions. But that's okay, because that's over in China where, you know, it's okay to destroy their environment with strip mining. It's okay to kill their children with lithium poisoning. Excuse me. And when you plug in your electric car, how do you think the electricity gets generated? Yeah, there's some wind, there's some solar, there might even be some made from ocean waves, but the only reliable sources are either nuclear or oil or gas, you know, natural gas. The only reliable sources of generating electricity, except maybe Niagara Falls. We can usually rely upon Niagara Falls to make hydroelectric power. Although there have been times when the falls ran dry due to drought. <laughs> but they're rare. The cult of Greta. Oh, Lord, I've had enough of Greta. We are not destroying the planet. The planet will be here long after we're all dead or gone to other planets. We might be killing ourselves off. But why shouldn't I heat my home with natural gas when uh, never mind all the pollution in China and other third world countries or developing nations one forest fire in California can cause more global warming in a couple of days 
than I cause in a year. Oh, the lower classes are destroying the planet by taking the London trains to work? Why? Are the London trains burning wood to make steam? Like they did in the old days? I don't mind taking buses and trains. Trains are nicer than buses, usually. Although I have been on the Metrolink when I wouldn't even sit near the restroom that's on board, let alone use it. Extinction Rebellion. Oh, they, they occupy the London trains? Idiots. I wouldn't mind going back to horse and buggy, except it would take me a week just to go to the doctor down the hill that I have to see once in a while. As it is, it takes me a couple hours to get there by bus. The working class kicked them off. Good for them. But... Um, I just can't afford to support a car, especially in California, where a gallon of gas is more than $4, and insurance and taxes on your car are just outrageous. Between gasoline, insurance, and taxes, those were costing me more than a monthly payment on a car back when I had a car. So, in order to make the car payment, I had to leave it parked in the driveway because I couldn't afford the license and insurance. So, I gave it up, gave it back to the loan company. Never looked back. And the doctor's clinic where I go gives me free bus passes. Buses here are ridiculous, but they kind of get me there. And I can sometimes get a ride from a friend. <clears throat> so anyway, I ho hope you've enjoyed our chat on this Veterans Day. But I am going to have to get going soon. In 1970, they were, by the way, just yeah, terrifying us high school kids by telling us that the Ice Age was about to begin. That we were all going to freeze to death because of global cooling, because we burned so much gas and oil. The fact is, we're in an Ice Age. It hasn't ever ended. We're in what we they call an interglacial period, a relatively warm period between parts of the same ice age. There's plenty of evidence, for example, that at one time there was tropical vegetation in Antarctica, in Greenland, in Iceland, in Siberia. There was at least temperate grassland with little buttercup flowers and stuff. <clears throat> Does that really mean that the earth moved and, and the poles were in a different spot so the ice moved? Or does it mean that at one time the earth didn't have all that ice? Oh, duck and cover in school. Yeah, like getting under your desk and going like this is going to save you when the atomic bomb is dropped. I really suspect that we are going into another ice age or glacial period. The troops died for our highway system. Oh, for oil? We don't even need to import oil. It's it's all a, a shell game.
I'm not thrilled with being so close to San Onofre where they've shut down at least one of their reactors because it's unsafe. One good earthquake and it's only about 70 miles away. I could get, I could glow in the dark. But there is nothing cleaner than natural gas. Windmills, uh, even if the birds don't fly into the blades and get sliced up, the uh, windmills mess up the air currents on which birds fly. And they're unreliable. The wind doesn't blow all the time. Solar panels kill all sorts of wildlife. And they take up a lot of space. And they're made with nasty chemicals that have to be mined in other countries because it's impossible to mine them here. Even if you find a deposit, uh, you can't get jump through the right hoops to get permission to mine them. And uh, anything that touches them can get zapped, if not with electricity, then with heat. <sighs> the old-fashioned windmills, like in Holland, turn slowly. The mills that ran, you know, that ran on water in a running stream turn slowly. So some of these electricity producing windmills turn slowly, but there's hundreds of them, sometimes thousands in a field. They're messing things up. <coughs> and they're unreliable. And a solar panel only works when there's sunlight. Although I would like to get a portable solar generator. That I can live with. For emergencies, it would run the refrigerator and keep the food cold. And maybe run a light. But, you know, we have to come up with something better. And until we do, I'm okay with burning natural gas. It burns very cleanly. I, have, I burn it in my heater and on my stove, and it doesn't pollute the air in my house, even with all the doors and windows closed. And there's lots of it. So much so that more so in the 60s, but even now, quite often, the oil wells just burn off the natural gas because the oil is so much more valuable, more expensive. Oh, well, I really got to get going soon. I want to thank you all for listening. Even when I'm just nattering. Oops. Four, not over. Ah. I, my keyboard is dyslexic. Anyway, we can't use Iraqi oil. It, it's so dirty that we can't refine it to meet the standards in the U.S. We could use Iranian oil, but they aren't selling it to us. Europe needs their oil. We have more oil in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, like from like Mexico and Texas over to Florida. We have more oil there than we'll use in the next 20 years. <coughs> and that isn't all the oil we have. We don't have to uh, frack for petroleum, but 
between greedy corporations and government regulators who just love the power that they can wield. That's what happens, fracking. When I was a kid in Culver City, I used to play in the Baldwin Hills. The oil was so close to the surface and under so much pressure, it was seeping up out of the ground all by itself. The oil companies had some little donkey engines pumping oil into their pipeline, but there was tar and there was oil all over those hills, just seeping up. So don't tell me we need to frack. We need to deal with crazy regulations by bureaucrats who ought to go get a real job. I would say that I flip burgers, but at Pup and Taco, they never let me cook anything. I just ran the cash register and cleaned the tables. I have done factory work. I've done art framing. I've done clerical work and bookkeeping. And <laughs> up and taco. I wish they were still around. They had the best hamburgers. It was really good lean ground beef. Awesome stuff. And because I worked there, I could get the guys who did the cooking to make it to order for me. You know, um, special order, not just flip the burger and, and throw it together the way customers got it. I could have extra mayo, extra lettuce, or no pickle, or whatever. <clears throat> anyway, we have too many bureaucrats and too many bureaucratic agencies. If Trump is doing anything right, that it's reducing the bureaucracy. I'm not terribly happy with him right now, but I don't like any of the Democrats either. So, you know, it's ridiculous. They're all out of touch with real life and real people and real work. I was shocked when Bush, the son, George H., didn't know how to shop at a grocery store. He'd always had someone else doing that for him. And when the, the clerk scanned the barcode, he goes, what's that beeping sound? I'm like, oh my God. They've only been doing that for 10 years. Oh, well. So on that note, once again, thank veterans, all of them. Those who only stand and wait, they also serve. And those who gave their all, we should honor them. We should honor them all. So I'll catch you guys another time. And thank you all again. Let's do a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thanks again, Oswald. And bye-bye.